Alhamdulillah. Dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, and welcome to a new episode of Contemporary Fiqh Issues. We have with us again in the studio Sheikh Asim bin Luqman al Hakim. Sheikh Asim, welcome. Jazakumullah khair, and thank you for having me. Barakallahu feekum. Sheikh Asim is one of the well known callers and du'at who has traveled extensively across the globe, delivering lectures and da'wah to both Muslims and non Muslims alike. Sheikh Asim, we know that killing or taking a soul uh, is generally prohibited in all the major religions and is something of, of great concern and great evil that is going on where people are being killed unlawfully. But what about things like euthanasia? What is the Islamic ruling on euthanasia? We'd like to discuss that issue with you, inshallah. But first we'd like to just go to a report that we filmed with uh, Dr. Samah Marawi here in Egypt. So let's just go to the report first, inshallah, and then we'll come back with your permission and okay. discuss the issue. Jazakallah khairan. Let's go to the report. Euthanasia uh, is taken from a Greek word called uh, good death. That's to say, euthanasia is ending life, is a practice of ending life in a painless manner. It is done for patients with cancer, who has uh, metastasis all over and suffer from severe pain during the course of their diseases. Euthanasia is carried uh, voluntary or involuntary according to the patient can, can, is capable of giving a consent for himself to end his life in a painless manner or by one of his relatives if he is unable or on mechanical ventilation. It is carried either uh, actively or passively. Passively, it's just withholding uh, medication or uh, a machine that is very essential for the patient's life. Actively, by giving the patient drugs that uh, facilitate ending his life in a painless manner. There are many devices used in the uh, issue of euthanasia, like the Thonotron, uh, in which we use uh, many drugs to induce euthanasia like uh, giving the patient a uh, sleeping barbiturate, like the sodium cyopentel, which is called here in Egypt uh, intraval. This induces sleeping to the patient. Then we give him a muscle relaxant as uh, a pancronium uh, bromide, and then give him a lethal dose of potassium chloride, which induce uh, stopping the heart in as asystole. This is one of the methods we use in uh, euthanasia. The other one is called the Mesitron or the Mercy Machine, where the patient is connected to a mask. This mask uh, is supplied by uh, carbon monoxide, which induces hypoxia for the patient. The other machine is called the Deliverance Machine. It's like a computer that is connected to the patient. And the bottom, it asks the patient uh, questions. When the patient uh, replies in a right way, uh, this machine delivered to the patient uh, a lethal dose of barbiturate, which induced death to the patient. Um, euthanasia is legalized in some countries, as Netherlands in April uh, 2002, and in Belgium in September 2002. Uh, some uh, cities in the United States, like Washington and uh, Oregon, also legalized the euthanasia. Here in Egypt and uh, most of the Arabic countries, it is not legalized. Uh, I think that in France there is a debate about this issue and uh, they are trying to legalize it, but yet it's not legalized. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. Sheikh Hassan, we just saw the report on euthanasia and the doctor, Baraklafi, was describing some very harsh and very shocking techniques that they use to really just kill people or patients who are, uh, in some cases, terminally ill. But what is the Islamic ruling on euthanasia? What, is, what does Islam say about this? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah rabbil alameen, sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala abdihi wa rasulihi al-ameen, nabiyyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. In Islam, it is forbidden to kill a soul, especially to kill 
oneself. Suicide is not permitted in Islam. And the origin of this is a hadith where in a battle between the Muslims and their enemies, there was a Muslim soldier who was doing quite well in fighting the non-Muslims, the enemies. And the Prophet ﷺ saw how his companions admired the way this man fights. Yet the Prophet said, ﷺ, he's in hell. And the companions were astonished. If this great, great and brave warrior is in hell, who's in heaven then? So one of them volunteered and said, I'll follow this man and know what would come of him. Because obviously, alhamdulillah, the Sahaba, they trusted the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 100%. And they Definitely. knew that he was sincere and his revelation was from Allah. So they said, okay. So they didn't say, oh, how can he be in hell? He's right, because this is forbidden Islam. We have to know that everything the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came with is true. So they said, I'm going to see why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that. And this is exactly what the companion did. He said that the man fought bravely. But just before the end of the, the battle, he was severely injured. And it was so painful, the man could not tolerate the pain. So he put the edge of his sword to his chest and, and leaned over it until it penetrated him and came out of his back, committing suicide. So the man went to the Prophet ﷺ and said, I testify that you are the Prophet and Messenger of Allah. The man did so and so. So he killed himself, fleeing or trying to escape the great pain he is suffering, not knowing that what awaits him at the side of Allah is far greater of punishment than what he was suffering. Killing oneself is prohibited in Islam. And what they call as suicide bombing is also prohibited in Islam. And we've mentioned this before mm -hmm. because it is killing yourself. You're the one who is pushing the button. You're the one who is detonating that bomb and killing yourself among others. So you're the one who killed himself. And according, accordingly, whoever kills himself goes to hell. And it is completely prohibited in Islam. This is the verdict of Sheikh Al-Bani, Sheikh Bin Baz, Sheikh Ibn Al-Tameen, and the major scholars of Islam prohibiting such uh, uh, um, procedures. Not to mention suicide bombing itself is indiscriminate. It targets innocent and non-innocent alike. And it doesn't care if there's a child on board the bus or whatever, wherever they detonate themselves. So yes, everything to them is collateral damage. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to their parents or to their loved ones, then it's a different story. They would not love anything to come to them. But anyone else, it's collateral damage. It's, it's acceptable. Barakallahu feekum, ya Shaykh. So is killing then completely prohibited in Islam in all cases? No, it's, it's not. Indiscriminate killing is prohibited. Killing the non-Muslims who are not fighting us is completely prohibited. Mm -hmm. In Islam, it's so prohibited that the Prophet ﷺ said that whoever saying. kills a non-Muslim in a Muslim country or a, a non-Muslim who has a, a, a treaty between us and them, like all other countries of the world, mm -hmm. whoever kills one will not have the fragrant or smell the fragrant of paradise. I pray, I fast, I do all the things that Islam tells me to do. And I would be deprived from entering paradise because, because I killed this non-Muslim? The answer is yes. Mm -hmm. You don't have the right to kill a non-Muslim. And the non-Muslim that you're allowed to kill is only at battlefield. Those who carry arms against us, who want to invade our country, who want to kill our people, these are the people we are allowed to fight and this is legitimate in all religions of uh, uh, this earth. Going to the Muslims, killing Muslims, this is completely prohibited. The Prophet ﷺ said that it is not permissible to shed the blood of a Muslim who bears witness that there is no God worthy of being worshipped but Allah and that I am the messenger of Allah, except in three cases. A married adulterer, a soul for a soul, or one who leaves the religion and splits from the Jama'ah. Ah. So these three, as mentioned in the Prophet's hadith, and there are two more. And these five 
it is permissible to shed their blood for the crimes they've committed. But not for an individual or for a vigilante to shed their blood. Definitely not. It is only for the ruler of that country. After being, uh, um, bringing him into trial and, and convicting him, then he has the right to do this. Sort of like capital punishment, or which they have in some states, they have the crime of treason. We could say that leaving the religion is equal to treason in the states, which is a capital punishment. That is true. And there are five types of people. The apostate, a Muslim that rejects Islam, mm -hmm. um, a, a married adulterer. So a person who is married or was married once in his life, and then he commits adultery, mm -hmm. he is to be executed. And we have a soul for a soul. So you kill someone, you have to pay for that. Mm -hmm. And fourthly, a bandit, a person who terrorizes people. Uh, but you mentioned, sorry, just to go back, when you mentioned someone who kills somebody purposely, not by accident. Definitely, okay. because if by accident he has to pay blood money. Mm -hmm. But if he kills someone purposely, then it is up to his family whether to take the blood money or to forgive him mm -hmm. or to have him executed. Okay. It's their right. And the bandit is a person who terrorizes people, mm -hmm. who steals their money, who barricades their roads, who uh, uh, terrorizes them, intimidates them, and maybe rape their women, kill them. Yeah. All of this is considered to be an act that is punishable by death in Islam. And finally, a spy. So any Muslim who spies to a non-Muslim country and takes information to them and relays it to them, he would be executed. Even if they still believe in Islam and even if they're only helping the non-Muslims for a financial gain. So they're not helping the non-Muslims because they secretly believe that their way of life is better because in such a case the person would no longer be a Muslim. But they're just helping them for some financial gains or whatever. But in such a case the person would still be tried and if convicted, executed. We're not mixing between things that nullify Islam or things that require the death penalty. Mm -hmm. It's a different issue, but I'm talking generally speaking about the death penalty. But as you've said, if he's doing this out of his allegiance to the non-Muslims, then he's an apostate mm -hmm. and he takes the same punishment. Barakallahu feekum, Sheikh, inshallah, we'll like to discuss, uh, continue discussing this issue, but right after the break, inshallah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Let's talk. So this is something that you have to point out to the to them in the Bible. And something which is, I think, very badly needed by the youth, which is uh, staying firm on the truth. This is just one of the greatest examples for me of how to control your anger. Within the framework of, of being the cleanest religion, the cleanest jurisprudence, and in the meantime, uh, uh, the kindest religion to animals. Watch Let's Talk with Khalil Amunet as he interviews guests and discusses a variety of topics, everything from youth issues to religious issues, Join us here on Hoda TV. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Shaykh Asim, just before the break, we were discussing the issue of killing in Islam and when capital punishment can and must be established if uh, the ruling party convicts and tries uh, an individual. Now, we briefly saw uh, the doctor discussing the issue of euthanasia. Could you please define for us, for those of us who don't know, what is euthanasia? Well, I believe the doctor did a very good job in defining euthanasia by saying that it is the good killing or the merciful killing. In the sense, this is the translation, the rough translation. Mm -hmm. We know that killing is killing. It's horrible. Mm -hmm. But in some countries, they think that it's a form of mercy, and that's why they call it mercy killing, mm -hmm. or the merciful killing, because the patient is undergoing severe pains, and it would be only fair that we relieve him of these pains by killing him. Mm -hmm. And this concept itself 
is though it appears to be nice and merciful but it is not first of all because it goes against what Allah the Almighty tells us to do secondly you can cascade this and the sky is the limit mm -hmm. so I can go to Brazil for example and see the children and the kids on the streets who have no shelter and don't have any parents and I kill them and they're dying they're starving whether they're starving or not but, but I know that they're gonna end up doing something wrong when they grow up okay. so they don't have any future so and, and this was the acts of some of the policemen in Brazil for example mm -hmm. they used to go on at night and kill as they kill stray animals <laughs> and if you ask them they will say we're doing them a favor instead of them being on the streets and without a future and it goes and the sky is the limit so the intention though might look to be good but the actual action is against Islam so euthanasia can be divided into two main types either killing a person who cannot bear the pains he's going through he's deteriorating he's terminally uh, uh, chronically and, and terminally ill he's mm -hmm. going to die but he wants to make this as soon as possible like the man you mentioned the hadith if you could just recap quickly for those of us uh, for yes, those who didn't the, see it the man who was injured during the battlefield during the battle and on the battlefield and he could not tolerate the pain so he committed suicide and despite his bravery he was still condemned to the hellfire for committing suicide which is a major sin that's that's true uh, also part of, of euthanasia or part of this first part is um, uh, deciding to terminate the pregnancy because of birth defect of the fetus mm -hmm. even if it was like six or seven months old if it's gonna be crippled if it's gonna be retarded if it's gonna be have this uh, uh, defects in it so there's a certainty the child's gonna be born and suffer yeah well they say we uh, terminate it and it is part of euthanasia the second part is unplugging the plugs so if the man is either suffering or he is considered to be uh, uh, brain dead so, so you just stop his his life support whether it's medication or a system. or, or the, uh, just take the uh, you know uh, unplug the machine yeah. th that runs the heart that runs uh, uh, the lungs mm -hmm. that cleans the blood etc so this is also considered to be part of euthanasia so are all these different forms haram I mean let's say there's a family that has a financial uh, problem and they have a sick father for example now he's in the hospital he's been diagnosed by many doctors as terminally ill he's going to die it's just a matter of when there's no chance of his recovery and they're spending thousands and thousands on medication and on equipment just to basically keep him alive in a vegetable state now we're not saying that they go and stab him or they go and inject him with a lethal dose of any chemical that would instantly kill him but is it permissible for them to stop treatment if the patient is alive it is not permissible for them to do that but if he's in a vegetative state if he's dead clinically mm -hmm. but what's keeping him pumping is these machines then scholars say that it is permissible to take the plugs uh, uh, out what if they can't afford do they have to go and uh, in the case where he's still alive but they can't afford the treatment they have to go is it obligatory for them to borrow money from people and if they can't borrow money do they have to take out a loan if they can maintain his life they have to do all the means possible and Allah would not question them except on what they can deliver Allah will not burden a soul with more than they can bear yes if he's alive in you can have the means to keep him alive and he's sound and he can hear you he can talk to you and he's alive you have to keep the machines running but you can only take the plug off when the brain is dead and a committee of trustworthy doctors come and say the brain is dead it's deteriorating there's no way back there's no way that he's going to be revived the brain is completely dead mm -hmm. only then the plug can be taken off but the man would not be considered dead 
until the heart and the lungs, the breathing that is, completely ceased to work. So the minute it is stated that the brain is dead and we take the plug off, he's not dead yet. Mm -hmm. The minute the heart and the lungs stop uh, functioning, then he's considered to be dead. Subhanallah, we ask Allah to make our affairs easy and to help the Muslims who, who are going through this issue. Mm -hmm. Uh, you mentioned briefly about abort abortion of fetuses before it's an actual child that are known or that are certain that it will develop into a child that has major defects or dysfunctions. Would aborting that uh, fetus be considered permissible? The scholars differ, but the majority say if a committee of trustworthy doctors confirmed with evidence beyond doubt mm -hmm. that the child would have these deficiencies and would have harmful birth defects and not minor ones but serious ones and it's going to be painful and the child's going to die after birth only a while if this is the case and they're trustworthy and it's a committee and it is before the age of four months before the spirit or the soul uh, was breathed into the fetus, mm -hmm. scholars say it is permissible to abort the pregnancy. But once the soul was breathed in, once the child or the fetus is more than four months old, no matter what is the status of the fetus, the pregnancy has to go on and it's not permissible at all to uh, abort the pregnancy. You were mentioning before then... Um the issue of capital punishment in the beginning of the episode. So, alhamdulillah, that this issue uh, of euthanasia, for the most part, is not practiced in most of the world and from what I've gathered in any of the Muslim countries. But what about somebody, or a Muslim, for example, who, who works as a doctor in a non-Muslim country that practices this and actually does perform it? And he were to be tried eventually, let's say, in an Islamic court. What would his punishment be? Would he be charged with murder? If he does the means that leads to the killing of a person, then he is a murderer. Mm -hmm. So if he's the one who takes the plug off and the, 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 the patient is alive, is still living, mm -hmm. or if he's the one who injects him with a lethal injection or gives him medication that kills him or escalates in his, uh, uh, um, accelerates his, his uh, uh, death, mm -hmm. then he is considered to be the murderer. Regardless of whether or not the patient demanded it. We mentioned in the issue of, um, I believe it was insurance. If both parties agree to, to the contract, even if it's haram, then what's the harm? But yeah. if somebody agrees, okay, says, I want you to kill me, then they're agreeing to commit suicide because they're actually demanding it and they're requesting it. And you're agreeing to kill them and murder them. So you're both agreeing to haram in a sense. And Yes, and we have a difference in Islam between the person directing it and the person executing it mm -hmm. so in terms of abortion for example if you recall we said that an aborted fetus if after four months uh, age of, of, of uh, four months old then they would have to give the blood money of five camels worth mm -hmm. now if a woman goes to a doctor and tells him to operate so that she would, uh, uh, the, the, the pregnancy would be aborted. Mm -hmm. Who is responsible and who's the one who's supposed to pay this five camels worth? Mm -hmm. The scholars say it's the doctor. Because though the mother ordered it, the one who did the execution is the one accountable. It's the final culprit. Yes, of course, they're both sinful, but he's the one who's supposed to pay. Likewise, in the case of the doctor, even if the patient insists on the doctor killing him and the doctor does that, then the, it's the doctor who is the actual murderer. And the patient's, obviously the patient can't be tried at that point, but uh, Islamically... By Allah, would, he would definitely be tried. Well, I, I was getting to, but would the patient be considered, c have committed suicide? Yes, he would, because it he was his decision. It. Yes, it was his decision. Barakallahu fikum, ya Shaykh. We'd love to continue and discuss this issue, but unfortunately, we're just about out of time. Please join us again. Next week, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.